You want to start off by reading a piece? Sure. <clears throat> On December 21, 2019, the longest night of the year, I was taking a post-sunset walk following an asphalt trail that meandered through the nearby municipal golf course adjacent to my neighborhood toward the top of a hill that happened to be the highest point in the town of Blacksburg, Virginia, a spot that allowed visitors to view during the daylight hours the icons of our little town, the football stadium, the turret of the colossal administration building, the coal plant, the futuristic looking art center and distant mountain ridges. My wife and son also enjoyed this view, but I usually took these walks alone to clear my head after a long day of teaching and writing and reading or simply to get some fresh air. Hours earlier, I had attended a Virginia Tech basketball game with my friend Robert and his 13 year old son, Felix, the latter of whom had floated an idea he'd heard a YouTuber endorse. That as the Mayans had predicted, the universe had ended in 2012. We were now living in a simulation, <laughs> which explained why everything these days seems so messed up. Admittedly, this was an intriguing theory to consider as I walked through the longest night of the year, which so far happened to be moonless. A smattering of stars appeared in the sky, clotted here and there with tufts of cloud, drifting low enough to reflect the pinkish lights of the town center and the Virginia Tech campus. So convincing, I thought to myself. I meant the reality of it all. Like what I was seeing, it seemed so believable. <laughs> As it had become my habit on these random walks of mine, I decided to call my father. For the previous three months since my mother had died, he'd been living by himself on a remote piece of property in the mounds of Southwestern North Carolina in the big brick house that he and mom had moved into when I was 16. I'd often imagined, though he'd claimed this was not the case, that he might be lonely. Hello, he said. Hey, I said, what am I, interrupt what am I interrupting? That was his line, the one he used whenever he called me. Well, he replied, I've been meaning to tell you, some weird stuff's been happening. This wasn't news. Weird stuff had been happening for a while. The weirdest of all, my mother, at the improbably young age of 73 had died. Even though I'd been there to help lower her coffin into the grave in our family cemetery, a clearing in the woods behind my parents' house on land that my grandparents had originally purchased nearly 40 years before, I often caught myself wondering, where did she go? Everyone who'd known her had come to accept more or less how she would die. She'd been diagnosed with dementia in her mid sixties and then Alzheimer's and then finally, Parkinson's. But the fact of her disappearance seemed no less incomprehensible. You see, once upon a time, my mother had been a dynamo. She whipped up extravagant meals, canned vegetables, baked bread, tended to flowers, managed finances in my father's dental office, served as a leader for the so-called fruit program that sold boxes of Florida citrus to local town folk in order to raise funds for our local church school practiced the hymn she would play on the piano for church on Saturday morning, led religious educational classes for young children, corresponded with family members and distant friends, made trips to visit her parents and siblings in upstate South Carolina, refilled hummingbird feeders, read her Bible, drank cups of instant coffee, ate chocolate chip cookies, and laughed. Everyone in my family on both sides expected that she'd be the last to go that as they wilted into the fragilities of senescence, she would be taking care of them. A decade before, it would have been impossible for any of our family members to imagine she'd slowly expire three months before her 74th birthday. Of course, years before that, she'd stopped becoming herself. We all missed the versions of my mother before she disappeared for good. Once she was gone, we simply missed the person she'd always been daughter, friend, sister, wife, mother, grandmother. As her eldest son, her disappearance imbued me with a new superpower. By imagining her standing in her kitchen long before she could have had the wherewithal to imagine her future demise, I could make myself cry. I was therefore at all times and anywhere 30 seconds from tears. 
For two nights, my father said he looked out his bedroom window down the grassy hill to the pond and to a nearby mountain ridge. There in the woods, he observed a number of lights flashing. A light would appear and disappear as quickly, bright brief, brief flashes. A few seconds later, others would appear somewhere else. According to my father, these lights never moved. That is, he had not been able to observe them as they moved. He'd only been able to perceive how they reappeared in different locations, giving the impression that there were either many lights or one single source that reignited after rep repositioning themselves. His first explanation, coon hunters. Even so, he hadn't heard any dogs. And what was also strange, the flashes hadn't behaved like flashlights, hadn't appeared as beams, hadn't swung through the dark. They'd simply flash very quickly on and off, like mysterious signals. Or, and this seemed more likely, the result of pranksters playing elaborate and unkind tricks. My father had considered driving his Highlander down the road to get closer. He'd imagined retracting his sunroof and firing a shotgun into the air. I didn't ask why, though I suppose he figured this might serve as a kind of warning. A shotgun, he assured me, fired skyward, wouldn't hurt anybody. I could be standing on the porch, he said, and you could be down by the pond and I could shoot you with a shotgun and nothing would happen. <laughs> We should try it, I said. <laughs> Maybe on one of my grandchildren first. <laughs> I laughed. So now what? He didn't know. He'd gone to sleep the night before by convincing himself the lights had been the result of wind jostled branches scraping against power lines and causing sparks. But the next morning he'd thought no and despaired to say idea is dumb. He'd walked to the place where, according to his estimation, the lights had appeared. There he followed a trail winding to the ridgetop. He hadn't found anything, though he'd confirmed something he'd already known. The woods were too densely tangled to negotiate properly. In addition to trees, the forest housed too many vines and briars and rhododendrons for anyone to navigate at the speed the flashes would have required. He couldn't say what he'd seen. Even so, he'd convinced himself of one thing for sure, the lights, we're not human in origin. Maybe I suggested it's mom trying to get in touch with us. Dad ignored me. He knew that I knew he didn't believe in ghosts. His religion wouldn't allow it. My father had no other choice on the first day of winter and the longest night of the year but to keep watch and to wait. I've always known that my father was famous in our town and beyond because he was a very good dentist. And also that he was not like any of the other dentists that I knew. And as it turned out, I knew an absurd number of dentists. <laughs> my grandfather, my mother's father had been a dentist and one of his sons had been a dentist. My mother's youngest sister had married a dentist. Two of my cousins became dentists. Another of my cousins married one. And because my father had gone to dental school, many of his classmates who remained some of his best friends also worked as dentists and their wives were often or had been, like my own mother before she'd had children, dental hygienists. And because the denomination to which the vast majority of our family members pledged allegiance, the Seventh-day Adventist Church had been shaped, at least in part, in opposition to mainstream society, and because its founders had seen fit to organize the construction of its own educational institutions, and had thereby manufactured its own idiosyncratic and insular culture and society, one that was interested in both spreading the gospel and maintaining the very good health of its members, as well as its fellow humans, many people who'd been raised in the church had matriculated through its elementary, secondary, and advanced educational institutions, became pastors or teachers or medical professionals. Of those medical professionals, a great many became physicians. A great many also became dentists. Unlike other dentists I knew, my father did not drive expensive cars or play the stock market. He did not, despite the suggestions of healthcare management professionals, avoid making friends with his staff, but instead became a kind of father figure to the women, affectionately called the girls by both my parents, who worked for him, a confidant in whom they trusted for advice about boyfriends, ex-husbands, kids, and managing credit card debt. For years, he drove a beat up Ford truck 
the inside of which was littered with magazine inserts, dirt clods, packets of stale Trident sugar-free gum, mint-flavored dental floss, and cardboard boxes of rubber gloves. His shoes and most of his clothes he'd been cycling through for decades. Unlike other dentists who packed as many patients into a day as possible, my father did not hurry. He had no quotas and for many years avoided thinking about money to the extent that if a patient couldn't or simply refused not to pay, he declined to track them down. He worked slowly, patiently, carefully. He tapped gently on gum lines to test whether Novocaine had taken effect and if necessary, repeated injections. Patients often exited his office with drooling mouths stuffed with bloody gauze, dazed by the fact that they hadn't felt a thing. <laughs> I'd witnessed that kind of scene unfold a hundred times. As a kid, I'd spent entire days in that office watching I Dream of Genie and Bewitched on a tiny television suspended from the bottom of a cupboard in the dental lab, where the girls stirred impression mixture in flexible green bowls or visited the fridge to pour shots of Diet Pepsi into Dixie cups. Periodically, my father would call me to an examination room saying, I'd like you to meet my girlfriend. And there, beaming in the dental chair, would be a little old lady whose gnarled hands squeezed his. My father was an indiscriminate flirt and his patients, men, women, and children, all loved being at the center of his attention. They brought him sacks of tomatoes and okra and corn and potatoes, jars of honey, venison jerky, hand carved walking sticks, quilts, knives with pearlescent handles, jellied rhubarb in jars with stickered lids that recorded the dates of the canning and scrawled cursive. Buckeyes for good luck. He befriended bulldozer operators, postal clerks, high school teachers, retirees from Florida, ex-Olympians, ex-cons, masseuses, farmers, real estate agents, mechanics, prisoners in leg irons, sheriffs, deputies, drug addicts, covert marijuana farmers, lawyers, carpenters, pharmacists, and conspiracy theory peddling militiamen. <laughs> there was the bank teller who'd never been caught without makeup even when she mowed her lawn. The old nun who at Christmas time maintained a manger outside her apartment door with flashing lights and stuffed animals. The overall millionaire who'd owned one of the planet's largest land clearing companies. The ruddy, big cheek, pot bellied man who rode a moped and claimed to be the first cousin of Xavier Roberts, inventor of the Cabbage Patch Kids doll. <laughs> the one eared man who kept a dried up, quote unquote, bear pussy in his billfold, <laughs> which according to my father was a wad of dried up skin and hair. The jailer who relayed stories about the kinds of objects that female prisoners had stuffed up their respective buttholes. A carton of cigarettes in one instance, an entire bedsheet in another. <laughs> I'm gonna skip to 55. I feel like I'm getting a correction for the audience. Um, <laughs> There's been some development with the lights. My father texted this sentence on January 27, 2020. Siri, I said, call dad. Calling dad, Siri said. The phone rang. Hello, he said, what's changed? A lot, he said. Last night I woke up at 3 a.m. or maybe quarter of two, there was no moon. Actually, it was the dark of the moon. So everything was dark, pitch black. I didn't see any of the regular flashing lights, but then I saw something different, a swath of light where you go to walk across the creek to reach the pond, a ray of light, a ray of light lighting up the trees. I put my glasses on and must have fallen asleep. I woke up wearing them. This morning at 4.30, I looked out again, no question. It was a beam of light. Then at six o'clock, it appeared again for about 30 seconds. Then it went out. This big light was larger than the beam of a car's headlights and it came down the other ridge above the pond. I don't know what to say, except it had the qualities of a beam of light. Like in the summertime when the moon comes up and there's a hole in the trees where the light comes through. Were you wearing your glasses? Of course I was wearing my glasses. Okay, keep going. If you had a big truck with lights on the roof, it was like that, a big powerful light shining down and it was going more across the pond than on the pond. And it was like when the whole column moved, it pivoted where its origin part was, a whole column of light. This morning at 5.45, it did the same thing. 
And when this big light appeared, so did the other lights. And in fact, the big light appeared to excite the smaller ones. Lots of lights, white, red, yellowish. I tried to film it, but the minute I touched my phone, they disappeared. No way, I said, yeah. What do you mean by excited though? I don't know. They all just seemed to be blinking faster and at regular intervals as though they were happy to see the bigger light appear. In my mind, I imagined the lesser lights were somehow welcoming the larger one. Like all that extra blinking, I don't know. I imagined that it might have functioned like some kind of applause. You know, this uh, memoir is a, a number of things. It's about obsession, it's about grief, and it's about uh, the pandemic. But it's a big love story, you know. And you, you have, I would say this if I had not just met your dad over there, but you had really, have really great parents, you know. I want you to explain how this book became called um, All of Us Together in the End. Can you remember this? I can. Um, Your first book was out. Well, several books were out, but, um, oh, no, no, my first book was out. My first book was out, and uh, my cousin had read it, and she had taken offense of the way that I portrayed people in my church, although I had, you know, I'd gone, I thought, to great lengths to, to create a real, realistic portrayal of, of those people. Um, and I'd gotten an email from my cousin saying that she read an interview with me where I had talked about my parents' response and, you know, that I portrayed my mom as saying, you know, like, oh, you're so imaginative and creative, which is what she always said. And, um, and then I'd said my dad was more of a Sudoku player. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a big reader. But um, she said, you couldn't be more wrong. Your parents are really worried about you. And I said, mom, I was talking to her over the phone. I said, mom, isn't this crazy? Like I, I, you guys have never you know, said that you're worried. Man. And, and I've, you know, I've always felt very close to my parents. And, um, and I heard her, first of all, go silent, which if you knew my mom, she was never silent. She was full of life, full of words, full of laughter, um, full of jokes, um, always talking. I said, mom, are you there? And she didn't respond. And I could hear a quiet weeping in the background. And I maybe heard her cry two or three times in my life. And I said, mom, are you okay? And she said, I just want us all to be together in the end. Meaning I was the one she was worried about you know, not yeah. making it to paradise. And I said, well, you know, even though my sister's a member of the church, who's to say she's going to make it? <laughs> and, you know, oh, I know, I know, but I just worried. And she's, wor she's very worried about me. Yeah, it's and, a great, it's a great gift she gave you, but I mean, you know, to do that. Uh, let's talk a little bit, and I got some uh, characters here, and so, this book is so chock full of extraordinary um, people, not characters, they're real people. When your father, Dr. Vollmer over there, kept going on and on about all these lights and stuff, you found it upon yourself to do a little bit of research and you wrote to this guy named Dr. Gritson down at San South Dakota State University. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you wrote him that letter? Because if, if it were, I would have started off, dear Dr. Gritzner, I'm very interested in your work. I am not crazy and neither is my dad. <laughs> Well, I mean, the first, so when I started researching this for real, I wanted to see if there were any books written about ghost lights, uh, which is what these things are often called. They're also called Will of the Wisp. They're, they're called Jack Lantern. Del Car I mean, there's lots of, lots of different names for them. So I just typed ghost lights into Amazon. And the first thing that came up was Halloween lights, right? And so I said, okay, let's go to books, all right? And the first book that came up was North Carolina's Ghost Lights, um, written by Charles Gritzner, published by Blair Press, which 
Detroit and North Carolina, yeah. right? Yeah, and Lynn York, who is or was the publisher or who had some um, purpose to play with that, she was in a um, workshop with Lee Smith and I and at NC State. Wow, wow. And so she, there was all these weird coincidences too. Um, and so I looked him up and saw that he was a professor emeritus at South Dakota State University. I just sent him an email and he was like ecstatic to hear from me because he's like, oh, and he, he, his, his book says, North Carolina has more ghost lights um, than any other state in, in, the, in the United States. Um, and he, his book like talks about all of them or talks about people's depictions of them. And his conclusion is just like, I don't know, it's, his conclusion is I know what these are or I can understand them. It's just like science maybe could check them out um, because nobody seems to care about them. And I wrote this book to, in hopes that I could advocate for this, the further study of this. Because even, even in folk, um, folk studies and mythology mm -hmm. and stuff like that, like people don't seem to care as much about, about ghost lights. So uh, me and Fritz, that's his nickname, had a, had a correspondence going for a while. And he was, he was very interested in, yeah. in this sighting. Uh, tell us about Well, I hope you don't mind reading. I, I really love this piece right here. It's on page 151, I think. And it's only, it's after the section break and it goes to 152, three quarters down. Do you mind reading yeah, that no, your mom? Yeah. My mother liked to crank up her soft South Carolina drawl. She had a weakness for suddenly distorted facial expressions. <laughs> She could touch the tip of her nose with her tongue. She struck overly dramatic poses. She pretended to dance by biting her lower lip, snapping her fingers and flapping her arms. She did not like cupboards that had been left open. She wasn't a fan of houseflies, indoor pets, dirty carpets, slow drivers, rap music, rock and roll, profanity, spicy food, or Willie Nelson's braids. <laughs> She relished vigorous walks and insisted on using her Nordic hiking poles to flick sticks off the road. She needed her paths to be free and clear and clean. She needed chocolate and cake and ice cream and oranges <laughs> and blisteringly hot cups of Maxwell House International Cafe and some coffee. She claimed preposterously to be immune to caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> Over the course of her life, she ate an estimated 15,000 slabs of peanut butter and applesauce toast. <laughs> she loved children and babies and dolls and tea parties and playing pretend. She watched The Sound of Music an estimated 53 times. She adored the Swiss Alps. She began every day with her open Bible. She learned to paint, but once the walls of her house had been sufficiently decorated, she laid down her brush. She sewed only to clothe herself and my sister. She took photographs to document things she wanted us all to remember, her children making silly faces in bathtubs, sledding on snowy days, my father holding an opossum by the tail. She wrote entire books only to record significant family narratives so that my sister and I could reflect on our childhoods as adults. My mother's sickness had announced itself rather unceremoniously with the simple act of forgetting. With the people my mother loved, no longer being able to deny that she was constantly repeating herself, to leaving out key ingredients in the pies she was making, to not being able to use her phone to take pictures or make calls, to studying a once familiar recipe and collapsing into sorrow with the realization that in her own words, she couldn't do anything anymore. In the end, she literally could only sleep and breathe on her own. God, oh my, I don't know how you wrote that because that's just, that's really. Well, then you asked me to read it. I know. So, <laughs> golly, that's tough. That's mean. It's so good. It's so <laughs> blankety blank good. I'd cuss, but. Um, tell me about uh, some of these characters come up like uh, Mimi and Andy Kaufman. You got a bunch of people who show up who are really into this 
believing in these lights and, and ghost lights and all that? Well, so once the lights started to appear, um, I couldn't show up about them. Uh, I was documenting them. I was talking to the, everybody who would listen, uh, friends, uh, family, students, fellow colleagues, whoever. And one of these people happened to be this woman named Mimi, who was renting my grandmother's house at the time, who um, we, my grandma's house and my parents' house uh, are on a piece of land that's a, a hundred acres. And they built their house first and it's about a quarter mile down the road from my parents. Um, and um, Mimi, as it turns out, uh, <laughs> Um, grew up in West Palm Beach and spent a lot of time in New York. She was a socialite. She was the daughter of millionaires, maybe billionaires, I don't know. Um, she came from money, uh, but in any time you talk to her, she's got a million stories. Um, it just so happened that she happened to be on Saturday Night Live the night that Andy Kaufman addressed the audience and said, um, I, it was in his phase where he was wrestling women, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And he was, he was saying things like, you know, women are only good for, he was trying to rile people up and he was like, women are only good for um, cleaning the kitchen and he's getting booze and stuff. And he's like, okay, well, if you think you can wrestle me, come on up. And so he gets this line of women to come up <laughs> and, and, the, and, and the Bob Zamuda, who's playing the referee, goes to each one of them and is asking the audience which one he want, they want him to wrestle. And they choose one, but then it's found out that she's pregnant and she's immediately disqualified. <laughs> so the next one is Mimi, who's just come from ballet class. And I think she might still have her tights on or something. And so they get in the ring. And let me tell you, Mimi gave him a run for his money. <laughs> Wrestled him for three minutes straight until he pinned her. And then they started dating. <laughs> <laughs> or going out, became friends or whatever. I mean, I don't want to speak for Mimi. But, um, so yeah, she was a she was a person who I asked about about the lights, and she claimed to have seen them. And she was, um, I mean, she's she's uh, she's she's a wonderful and a hilarious person. Now the, the next woman I want to ask you about is <laughs> Louisa. Mm -hmm. When you first met her, and you told her your life story, I was brought up in Seventh Day Adventist Church. She saw a tentacle come out of your head. <laughs> no, she she saw a tentacle come out of the ceiling and go into my brain. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Louisa was a shaman of sorts, right? That's right. And she saw these lights. She didn't see the lights, um, but but um, in 2011, I had some, uh, as a new faculty member, I had some research money to burn. And my chair at the time said, well, you should, you know, you should figure out a project. You should do some research. And I, at the time I was writing a novel that featured a, a, a shaman named Donnie Trueblood uh, <laughs> who, who was half Indian and um, anyway um, I decided I wanted to go interview or talk to a shaman and so I was like well where would you go to find a shaman and I thought well what's the most well I, I found it in New Mexico because it's the land of enchantment and so I googled New Mexico shaman and this woman came up and she had a great website and she looked like she knew what she was doing and so I made an appointment with her and then I drove 2000 plus miles uh, to New Mexico. I stopped at, um, uh, what's Elvis's, Graceland. Graceland. Stopped at Graceland, visited Graceland, stopped at Austin, stopped at Marfa, which is another place where lights yeah, yeah. happen. I didn't see any lights there. And then I went to see her and had a session with her. But then I went back to her um, just partly for the book because I was, I was interviewing as many people as possible. I was like, well, you know, I have got some research money to burn again. So let's, and it, she was quarantining in Spain at the time. So I Skyped her and we had an interview. Uh, How these people have landed in your lap. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's so um, serendipitous. That's a word I didn't think I'd use today. <laughs> um, just so, uh, as you all, as Matthew probably knows, I'm not, I'm a heathen. So um, <laughs> I have kind of a jaundiced eye toward a lot of religion. But, but I want y'all to know the greatest Seventh-day Adventist of all time 
was a guy named McKee who invented Little Debbie snack cakes. <laughs> He's my favorite. We should put a statue up of, of him. Uh, do y'all have, wait, let me ask you this quickly. Yeah. You've written both fiction and nonfiction. You haven't written any poetry, have you? I have written poetry. Are you um, crazy or something? <laughs> yeah. I, I started off with poetry. Yeah, I, yeah. Did, I did too, but that's stupid. <laughs> uh, do you find them, obviously they're different. One you like better than, the, one genre you like better than the other? I mean, I, I've i written on fiction for years now and I just started trying to get back to fiction and um, in part because it's so much more imaginative and there's a there's a satisfaction in making up a world and in world building in the way that I, I mean, you do world building in creative nonfiction, but you're you're recreating something, right? Mm -hmm. You're not making it up from whole cloth or partial cloth. So they both, they both, uh, you know, depending on my disposition and recommend themselves. Yeah. You got anything I didn't ask you? I was gonna have you read a little bit about the George Cumberland Academy. Would you, you can look at that? You may, it's on 16 and 17. Yeah, this is like at the bottom of 15. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read that? That'll explain us and then go to uh, I want to return 10%. Okay. If you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. For the majority of my four very formative years of life, ages 14 to 18, when I was attending Georgia Cumberland Academy, a Seventh-day Adventist boarding school in the heart of North Georgia, I lived without my parents. I spent summers at home and during the school year visited them periodically, once a month usually. And I spoke with them often enough on the pay phones in my dormitory's lobby, but they didn't often make appearances in my daily existence. The academy I attended wasn't the kind, I don't imagine, that the phrase boarding school might suggest to most people. There weren't brick walls or ivy or uniforms or rich people's kids. Tuition wasn't cheap, but if you couldn't afford it and counted yourself a member of our denom denomination, you could go. The worthy student fund at your local church would pitch in. Plus, everyone who attended school there, no matter what their financial situation, had a job. We'd been told that one couldn't put a price on Christian education, but somebody had to pay the bills. And even if our parents had money enough to pay our tuition, which wasn't, wasn't cheap, we had to help. We inserted time cards into time clocks. We prepared vats of pudding and spaghetti sauce. We sprayed hot water at trays students shoved through the dishwasher's window, used our gloved fingers to dig out the lentil loaf and green beans and mashed potatoes some a-hole had stuffed into a plastic tumbler. We squeegeed oily flesh smears from windows, answered phones, scribbled messages we'd never deliver. We skimmed algae from the sewage pond. We hosed down buses we mowed. We soldered stained glass at a warehouse beside the duck pond, sewed cushions for lawn chairs at the factory at the edge of campus. Work would teach us dignity, humility, and the value of a dollar. We kept a small portion to buy candy and caffeine-free soda at the dorm store or Taco Bell during weekly town trips, but most of what we earned went to our bills. The rest was tithe, and because we'd feared what would happen if we took what was rightfully God's, we checked the box during registration that said, yes, I want to return 10%. That's, a, that's, a, that's so much fun. You do such a great job in, um, I might have this wrong. I used to know this. I always say in psychology, there's this thing called bombardment theory, but I think it's called something else where, you know, if you're scared of snakes, they're really, really deathly afraid of snakes, psychologists or psychiatrists will have you watch a movie about snakes and then maybe sit in a room that's got an aquarium with snakes. And as it all ends up, you end up there with a, in a room with snakes slithering all over. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's called bombardment theory or something else. <laughs> Cruelty. But, but, I, but I, I like, I think in writing, there's a certain bombardment where you just list off everything and you, that's, you are the king of listing these things off. They're just beautiful. All those passages you read were really just gorgeous so we can just see everything you know, piece about Thank your mom you. you know it's just that's some beautiful writing does anybody i, I don't have any more y'all ask some questions uh, when you were talking about the shaman out in new mexico 
Well, what, what did the shaman say? Did the shaman know about these ghost lights? So the question is, um, when I went to see the shaman in New Mexico, did, did the shaman know about these ghost lights? Well, when I went to visit her, um, she did not know about the ghost lights because I didn't know about the ghost lights, but she did think that um, one of my problems was that I had lost a piece of myself and that it had happened at six years old when I had questioned something and I was gently rebuked. And that, <laughs> and that this <laughs> wisdom soul, as she called it, was living on a dude ranch um, <laughs> uh, and, and wanted to come home. And what I agreed to having him come home. And I said, sure. And so she did this ritual where she blew the wisdom soul back into my head and my heart. And honestly, she smelled faintly of garlic. Um, <laughs> so years later, um, she said, you know, um, when I told her about the life, she said, well, you know, this is, this is your mom. And she's trying to, you know, send a signal to your family that, you know, maybe, maybe the world is, is bigger than you think it is. And maybe there's more than, than you can know and acknowledge and have answers for. And then the struggle for that is you were brought up in a church that says, there ain't no such thing as ghosts. When you get buried, you die. That's it. Right. Right. And then but this is a phenomenon that's something's there. Right. I, I believe it was your mom, but that's just me. Would you have seen those things? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I you often hear writers say that that if you have an idea and talk about it too much, that then it becomes hard to write because you feel like you've already kind of told the story. And you said that you couldn't stop talking about this. Did you have any trouble with that once you sat down to write it? Think because you already you know, turned it over so many times in conversation. So the question is whether, you know, that it, it's, it's often said that if a writer talks too much about uh, what they write, that, you know, it becomes an impediment or, or harder to, to work with. You know, I, I sometimes think about that and wonder how great of a writer I could have been if I hadn't, if I could just keep my <laughs> mouth shut. <laughs> um, but I'm always telling people about my ideas and I'm always talking about what I'm up to. And, and sometimes as I'm telling them, I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you cursing I'm yourself? Real, Why I'm are real, you jinxing yourself? I'm right? superstitious about yeah. that. I will not, <laughs> no one, people always say like, do your friends read your work? I'm like, why would I do that to my friends? <laughs> and plus they're gonna say, you're stupid. And I don't wanna feel, you know, bad about it. I never talk. Well, I mean, but that's partly, I mean, partly that's how this book came to be is that I, I couldn't shut up. You get upset. And so I, whenever I, I, I didn't even know, I don't think that I was writing a book necessarily. I was just documenting something because I didn't know what to, what else to do with the weird stuff that was happening, right? I started documenting the lights because I knew dad wouldn't write it down. And I mean, no, no offense to him. He doesn't write things down, you know? Um, he's got too much to do. He's got lawn samo, he's got penicillin, teeth to pull. penicillin. Yeah, he's he's got penicillin to order, um, people to corral. Uh, but I mean, I'm just I'm just a writer, and so this comes naturally. I can call him up and it takes me 30 seconds to write down what he said. Um <laughs> uh, and then what was the other part I wanted to say? Oh, so when COVID hit, I knew this was another kind of unknown or mystery. It was not, I mean, the lights were local, a local mystery. Mm -hmm. COVID was a global mystery. Um, someone just sneezed. Um, <laughs> and, and so I felt like, I don't know what to do with myself, mm -hmm. but the natural thing is to write down. So I kept a quarantine diary and diligently or quasi diligently was writing down all the things I was doing. Like, you know, taking walks, wiping down my groceries like a madman. Oh, I remember, I remember um, those days, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm still paranoid. I've only had one haircut during COVID. I haven't been to a restaurant that I know of. I haven't been to a bar. Oh, well, I know I did with you yeah, just you now. Just um, I don't go out. I kind of like it better. I thought, you know, as big a ham as I am, I thought, man, I never go out. This is a blessing. Don't have to deal with anybody. Just kind of I mean, I was, I mean, I, I, I had that, I had a similar response, but I was also writing it all down. Um, and so before I knew it, I had, you know, and in talking to people, 
I would record what, what you know, what their response was. You know, I'd tell a student who just lost her mom, you know, what had happened to me. She gives me a story. Mm. So by, by relating stories, you get stories and you start collecting stories. And then you ask, hey, can I put this in my book? <laughs> <laughs> you look the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Stephanie. Yeah. So we have a question uh, from someone who's not right here. Um, and this might be a little strange since you have family here in the audience. But since you're writing a bit more about your family, what's family, how, how, do you, how does the finished product go over? They loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's people in the audience who I guess they argue. <laughs> They're buying hundreds of copies <laughs> after this show. I mean, I can only say um, that, um, you know, I, I did my best to, to tell the truth and you know, it, as you said, it is a love story. It right? really is. I mean, yeah. it, 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 I, I hoped it would come across as a love letter to my parents and to the way that they raised me. And, um, you know, my dad who's sitting here told me that uh, in a text that he was very moved um, after reading it. And, um, um, and the fact that he's here, you know, says, says a lot to me and, and means the world. So I fell in love with, uh, with Jim here when I read this book. You guys can exchange numbers after this. <laughs> I'll just say it too personal, but it's in the book. After, after Jim's wife died, after Matthew's mom died, he slept in bed with her for that night because I guess in Seventh-day Adventist, what do you call it? I mean, it's not a tradition. You, I know, but, but you, you bury, like, like you bury the the person like the next day or something i don't that? no that's not that it, that just we happen to have a family cemetery oh I right get you. I get which you. is you know 75 yards from our house and when my mom died in her bed you know i i came the very that very day and and for some reason i was like i better get there before she like melts into oblivion i it was a hot day i don't i don't know i was mm -hmm. i wasn't thinking right and i was like well dad where are you gonna sleep tonight and he said i'm gonna i'm gonna sleep where i've slept for the last 52 years God, my and, that's, just, that's and, and at first I thought eyes. I thought oh that's crazy and I thought like that's really beautiful it's really beautiful but I still don't like Dennis that much until <laughs> <laughs> by my team I won't go to him uh, actually I had a great dentist growing up real quick his name is Dr McBride and we took some um, three wisdom teeth one time when I was out of college I hadn't been to the dentist in like since I got my braces out so it'd been like six years he said does it hurt when you when you eat and i went no dr mcbride and he goes look at these x-rays and all my wisdom teeth were like you know this so he took them all out at the same time and i had to go get another checkup and when i did he said you want some more percodan and i went no no not really sure you don't want any more percodan my favorite dentist of all time <laughs> no, I'll just take another vial of <laughs> who else has a question Yes, I want to sure. say, is your name Kathleen? I've forgotten already. Yeah. Kathleen, yeah. Um, how, how was it that you decided at some point or when that this was something that you could turn into a book? And then where to begin? Okay, so the question is, how did I decide when this was a book and where to begin? Um, I had been working on a, as my mom was declining, I decided to work on a memoir about her and about um, growing up uh, in the faith community that I did in the place where I did. And I wanted it to be true and I wanted it to be complex and nuanced. And I wrote that book and I turned it into my agent a couple of days before she died. And my agent said, um, after he read, he, it took him a couple, three weeks to read. And he got back to me and said, this is good writing, but um, do people really want to read about personal grief? And I said, have you ever read literature? <laughs> and the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, but I did realize that I had some revising to do. It, it was kind of shapeless and uh, I didn't, and I was busy teaching that semester. I was teaching an overload and 
I just, I, I knew I had to get back to it and revise it later. And then, um, and then when the lights appeared and I started documenting the lights and COVID happened and it just became, um, it, it gave it a structure that it hadn't otherwise had. And so I could have like this linear timeline of experiencing these various unknowns, but also reflecting on things that I thought I had known for sure, or things that I, you know, wanted to know for sure. And that led me to kind of interweave uh, the narrative as it, as it exists today. That about it. Stephanie, get, oh, okay, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Have the lights continued? Yeah. I don't know. After the, the tree was completely illuminated, was that the last? Well, there were several other, there were several other things that weren't described in the book, but just. I forget about that tree turning all green. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it just lit up at mm -hmm. night. Tell them about when Evan, little Evan came down here where he wanted to see the lights. Which time the first? Well, uh, yeah. Premier's character. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to go. Sure. So, my father has asked me to tell you the part where I saw the lights, which was um, I brought a grad student down um, and to the house, partly because I wanted to see if the lights would appear if he wasn't there. You know, is this man delusional or is he <laughs> is he seeing things and am i seeing you know, like so he was in chicago for a dental convention it was february it was a moonless night it's a cold night it was a clear night and my friend and i had sat on the porch we lit a fire in the chimney we were sitting out there watching and it was seven eight nine o'clock dad calls pick up the phone have you seen anything no, you're kidding. No, we haven't seen anything. He was like, go to my bedroom window, which was at the time this, this sun porch, just all, you know, wall of all windows. Um, and he said, look out my bedroom window. So I went and looked out. And this is also the room where mom died. Um, and I looked out the window and um, didn't see anything. He said, open the window. I opened the window. And as soon as I opened the window, a light began to pulse in the distance. And it pulsed with different intensities and sort of, you know, moving a little bit, but basically being the same, same spot the entire night. And I tried, I know I didn't try to video it. Unlike when he, when he ever, he would pick up his phone the lights would go out. When I picked up my phone and I videoed it, you can hear my friend counting the pulses. One, two, three, four. Nothing appears on the, on the video. Wow. But both he and I were, it was bright as you can imagine. Um, wow. And, and yeah, and I thought, um, the, I mean, I, I slept, in that bed that night, and I would periodically rise up and was still going all throughout the night. That's spooky and cool. <laughs> when you were walking over to that window, you didn't like kick over a jar down there on the floor. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> well, inside joke till y'all read the book. <laughs> yes, me. So I was answering other questions. I was just going to ask. I guess you already have the answer of whether or not you want to answer it. Jordan, you're not going to talk about what you're working on. Um, no, I'm not really working on it. You're going to say something about, about the book you have coming out. And then, but Matthew, if you, want to, if you have anything to say about this, might be next. But I won't. Yeah, so I'm, um, I've, I'm trying to return to fiction and Again, here I am talking about what I'm, what I'm working on, <laughs> in part to, to help keep me accountable. Um, uh, it's about a group of boarding, it's, it takes place in 1991. It's a group of boarding school students who uh, want to have a party at a house in the middle of nowhere um, with a student who goes to the, the school, but who is a 
a community member. He doesn't have to stay at the school. He comes back to stay at his parents' house. His parents are gone and they decide to have a party and it ends in tragedy. I got a book of stories coming out August 15th called The Curious Lives of Nonprofit Martyrs. And every, because I always kind of try to think up a little game to play because I live in South Carolina where there's nothing else to do. So I say, I'm going to try to make every one of these main characters or minor characters work at a nonprofit, but I make up the nonprofits. They're not like UNICEF or Red Cross. <laughs> They're made up, some of them are a little bit foul when they do the little anagram. And then in November, uh, I have a book of essays coming out with um, Eastover Press, which Matthew had a book come out of essays with Eastover just about a year ago, I'd mm -hmm. say. And this is because of COVID. When I was just sitting around, I thought, you know, I read his book and I went, you know, I wasn't thinking like, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. I was just thinking, God, I've, been, I've written some essays over the last 30 years. Maybe I should try to get them together. Well, I don't save anything. So, and a lot of them were written on a typewriter. So I went back and I think I had four out of 30 essays that were like in Garden and Gun, Oxford American, Best American Food Writing, about Vienna sausages. Um, <laughs> I had to order online my own work from these <laughs> magazines and retype the daggone things because I don't keep anything. Same thing with that last book over there that I did, or right there. I didn't have half of those stories. I had to rip them out and do that thing where you, I forget what it's called, um, kind of Xerox them or something. What? Scan? Scan. I had to scan them. <laughs> scan didn't work, but the scan didn't work because. L's came out as ones and N's came out as M's. At one point I mentioned pom-poms and it came out porn porn. <laughs> kind of wanted to keep it that way. But editor wouldn't let me. So that's what I'm doing and just kind of fiddling around. 